So we're in a series called Away in the Wilderness. And it comes out of Isaiah 35. Isaiah 30, if you want to turn there or flip there or whatever, Isaiah 35 is a messianic chapter in the Bible. You've heard of messianic verses. Those are verses in the Old Testament that prophesy about the Messiah, which we know is Jesus. And this, Isaiah 35 is an entire chapter. There are messianic chapters. Isaiah 53, obviously, a messianic chapter in the Old Testament. And so Isaiah 35 is one also. Well, this is our third week. Uh, next week, by the way, is Memorial Day weekend. I know some of you will be out of town. Please watch online. But if you're not out of town, we actually have a veteran coming to speak next weekend who speaks full-time, who's gone to speak to our troops, who's one of the best speakers. So, he's, so please don't think you're gonna get something less than you would get if, if I weren't here. This guy's phenomenal. He's been speaking for probably over 40 years now. Um, and he's also one of the funniest guys you'll ever hear. And he is a, a veteran that was wounded. He received the Purple Heart. He had a phosphorus grenade to blow up in his hand right here when he was about to throw it. Probably shot by a sniper. And he's had multiple surgeries, uh, and yet he takes that tragedy and really just brings the humor out of what God did in his life and ministers to our servicemen and women all over the world. Um, he's incredible. So if you know a veteran or someone, and, and, and we all should celebrate uh, Memorial Day in memoriam of those men and women who've given their lives for our freedom, we should all be praying for our servicemen and women. So he'll be here next weekend. Then I'll do the fourth one in this, in this series the next weekend. Uh, and then we'll go uh, presbytery the next weekend. I'll preach that weekend as well. So uh, this is the third one. We talked about when the Messiah came, he brought strength, that we could have strength through him. And I told you three practical ways to strengthen your inner man. And then next week, we, last week, we talked about signs and wonders. And we prayed for ladies as, as well. And we prayed for many, many miracles at the altar that the Jesus came with signs and wonders and still does signs and wonders. This week, we're gonna talk about streams. So I, all of them begin with an S uh, just because I like to do that, and that helps us to remember. So strength, signs, and streams. By the way, you can read the last part of Isaiah um, 35 and see if you can figure out what S I'm gonna use next week, all right? And um, if you figure it out, uh, you get a 1% discount on your tie this month. And so <laughs> that's, that's actually not true. That's... Um, because the tithe doesn't belong to me, so you'll have to talk to God about that part. All right, so Isaiah 35, we're gonna start at the last part of verse six because that's where this section starts. It's the last part of verse six, the last sentence of verse six. It says, for waters shall burst forth in the wilderness. Now, I want you to think about what you're reading. Don't read over this. Waters in a wilderness. Waters shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. You just don't think about streams in a desert. The parched ground shall become a pool. Now, I'm gonna tell you in a moment, there's a natural fulfillment and a spiritual fulfillment to this. The parched ground shall become a pool and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of jackals, in other words, a place where desert animals live, where each lay there shall be grass with reeds and rushes. That's because of the water. Now there are a whole bunch of um, messianic scriptures along this line, and I had to just I just couldn't show them all, but I'll show you one more. Isaiah 41, verse 18, I will open rivers in desolate heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the, the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land, springs of water. All those things we just kind of read over, but if you think about them, it's a miracle to have pools of waters, streams, rivers, in a desert, in the wilderness. So there's a natural fulfillment. When you look at Israel, it's a garden in the middle of a desert. Every nation around it is a desert. And yet it's a garden. God did this. I, I was uh, reading this 
And let me just read you just uh, from, this is from a Jewish person who began to study Israel and the water in Israel. And his name is Seth Siegel. He's author of Let There Be Water. Let's, let's just listen to this. Uh, he talks about when people come up to him after his lectures. So that's where I'm picking up. He'll say what they want to learn. So he's talking about people who come up and ask him questions. What they want to learn, explains Siegel, is how a country, listen, that is 60% desert, a country that is 60% desert and whose population increased tenfold since 1948. The population of Israel, when Israel became a nation in 1948, has increased tenfold. Not only has enough water for itself, this is what people want to know, how can Israel that's 60% desert and has increased tenfold since it's become a nation, since 1948, has not only has, enough, not only has enough water for itself, but in fact has such a surplus that it exports water to its neighbors. In addition, Siegel writes, Israel provides large amounts of water from its own supplies to both the Palestinians and the Jordanians. And it exports, get this, billions of dollars each year of peppers, tomatoes, melons, and other water-intensive produce. Here's what I'd like to say. Would you explain that? Explain how one small country can produce that much water even to supply their neighbors with water and produce billions of dollars of water per, of, of, of fruit that is dependent upon water much more than other fruit and vegetables. So there's a natural fulfillment, but there's a spiritual fulfillment as well, that you don't have to live in a dry wilderness once you get saved. And I'll explain why in a minute. Isaiah 58, 11, you, you shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Jeremiah 31, 12, their souls shall be a well-watered garden. So there's a spiritual fulfillment as well, our spiritual water. Do you, listen, God doesn't have any problem providing water in the wilderness for his people. Think about when they went through the wilderness, how he provided water. He provided it, and Moses spoke to a rock spoke to a rock. Now, I don't know what he said to the rock, but he spoke to it and water came out. But here's what we don't know many times. That rock, listen, and listen, this is straight out, I'm gonna show you straight out of the Bible. That rock he spoke to, the Bible says, the New Testament tells us, was Christ. And it followed him. It's pretty amazing. But 1 Corinthians 10, 4, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And I don't know what you thought when you saw a rock following you. <laughs> but that's what the Bible says. And that rock was Christ. So when we talk about springs of water, rivers of water, we've got to understand, yes, God did something in the land of Israel for his people, in the, in the area of natural water that confuses scientists to this day. But he also does something for you and for me in the area of spiritual water. I don't have to live in a dry land even though I live in a fallen world. I can live in a river of living water. So I wanna show you, so that's what I wanna really focus on is the spiritual fulfillment of what the Messiah brought 2,000 years ago. So here's number one. Jesus brought the Holy Spirit. He didn't bring just a stream. He brought the river. He, Jesus brought the Holy Spirit. Now, before I go to a verse in John 8 that's very familiar to many of you, very familiar to you, you've read this verse, I need to give you a little background. It's talking about the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And on that last day, um, they prayed for rain. And let me just show you in Jeremiah 14, verses 16 and 17, it shall come to pass that everyone who's left of all the nations 
which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, on them there will be no rain. So here's what happened at the Feast of Tabernacles. Every year when they came to Jerusalem, they would, the last day was the day they prayed for rain. And they prayed for the Messiah to come because they knew Isaiah, and Isaiah said when the Messiah comes, he's gonna turn the desert into a pool. There's gonna be plenty of water. Are you following me? So they prayed for rain and for the Messiah to come. They would actually take a flagon. Now, you you may not have never heard of a flagon. How many of you have never heard of a flagon? Can you just admit it? Okay, all right. So let me show you a picture. These are Roman flagons. So it's, it's I said, let me show you a picture. That's kind of a play on words because it's a picture. <clears throat> I didn't know that until I just said it, but it just, it's just it, these genius thoughts come to me. Um, so it's what we would call a picture. Like it looks like a picture. Like today it would be glass and we'd put iced tea in it probably, you know. So that's what it looked like. These are actual from the first century from Rome, okay? Roman flagons. So they would fill up a flagon with water from the pool of Siloam. They would march. Uh, they would play the shofar and they would go to the temple and they would pour it out as an offering before God and they would pray for rain and for the Messiah. Two things they'd pray for, rain and the Messiah. Water and the Messiah, all right? That's John 8, the verse I'm about to read that many people don't realize the history. So the day they're praying for water and the Messiah Jesus does this, look, watch, John 7, verse 37. On the last day, that's the day they did this, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, he's at the temple now when they're doing this ceremony, and says, if anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. You know, he's actually telling them, I'm the Messiah. You're praying for the Messiah, I'm him. If you want water, I got it. But then he's also telling about the Holy Spirit because it says, verse 39, this he spoke concerning the Spirit whom those believing in him would receive for the Holy Spirit was not yet given but Jesus because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus came so that you could have a dynamic, powerful river in you, flowing through you and out of you, and his name is the Holy Spirit. And he's like a spring of water. One of the reasons that Israel has so many, has has so much water are the springs. Yes, the rain also in in the mountains, but there are springs. If you ever go to Northern Israel, most tours don't go there because it takes a while to get there. People say they don't like the long bus ride up or the long bus ride back but I've been there. I've been to, there are three springs at the, at the northern part of Israel that water the entire land. And when you get there, it's like fire hydrants and they're just, they've been just gushing for years and years and years and years. It's, it's, it's amazing. Pools and it's just springs and the water just coming up out of the ground and it just, it flows 24 hours a day. And God just created this, it's unbelievable. And you know what a spring is? A spring is just water just coming up out of the ground for no reason, it seems, but God just put it there. Uh, My, uh, Debbie's uh, parents had a spring on their land. And you could go and literally water is just rushing up out of the ground. I mean like a water fountain, just all the time. And so what they did was they bought those jugs of you know like distilled water at the store or spring water, but once they got about five or six jugs, they never bought any more, they just go back and hold it under the spring. I mean, why go buy a jug that says spring water when you got a spring in your yard, you know? And some of those, by the way, that say spring water might be a guy in the backyard with a water hose. (laughs) So be cautious, all right? So anyway, so, but Debbie's dad, there's a funny story in our family because Debbie's dad, as he got older, his hand would shake. And you've seen some people that have this and his hand would just shake. So when he would hold the jug under the spring, you know, his hand would shake like this. 
And so one of the granddaughters was there with him one time, and he said, why don't you hold the jug? So she said, Papa, do you want me to shake my hand too? <laughs> she thought that, that that did something with the water. So, But there's a spring that springs up. Okay, so, and that spring is the Holy Spirit. Now, please let me just explain to you things about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Greek word parakletos, and I'm saying it as two to help you get it. Para being P-A-R-A. Now, you've heard paraclete, which is an English um, translation of it, and that's okay. I don't mind you saying it, but in the Greek, it would be parakletos. Para means alongside. Kletos means to walk. So the Holy Spirit wants to walk alongside you. I want you to think about that. Would it be all right if all through your day, every meeting you were in, if the Holy Spirit just walked with you through your whole day? Wouldn't that be great? And there are other Greek words that, you, again, we get English words from, but parabole, parable. Para means to throw along, I mean, I mean, it means alongside, pardon me. Bole means to throw. It's where Jesus would throw a story beside a truth so you could, be, you could be able to understand the truth because he would throw a story beside it. Um, uh, paragraph. See, we have P-A-R-A in our language a lot. Paragraph. Grafe means writings. Para means alongside. So it's writings or sentences alongside other sentences. That's called a paragraph. You follow me? So it's all through. So this word, by the way, parakletos, uh, is translated helper, consoler, intercessor, but the old King James and some other versions translates it comforter. And some of you remember that because we used to only have the old King James, and we'd read about the comforter. I remember thinking about the comforter. Now, this is a, a funny story that I've told here before, so maybe you've heard it, but you'll still laugh because it's just funny. But when Debbie and I first got married, everything we had was a hand-me-down. And we went over one night to these people's homes, and they had a new comforter on their bed. And Debbie and I had a bed spread. And it was probably about four generations old, you know, and very, very thin. And this comforter was really thick. And I remember thinking, man, that's nice. And she said to me on the way home, could I, would you mind if I bought a comforter? And I said, no, I think that'd be great. So she went and bought a comforter. I came in from work. I worked for my dad's company at the time. And I came in from work, and she said, let me show you. We went in the bedroom, and there's a beautiful comforter. I remember thinking, that's going to be so wonderful to sleep under that comforter, you know. And so then we had dinner. We watched some TV. I go in. We get ready to go to bed. The new comforter is gone and the old bedspread is back on the bed. And I said, what, what happened to the new comforter? And she goes like this. <sighs> now she's done that a lot in our marriage. <laughs> like, you know, you're, you're such an idiot, you know? <sighs> she said, Robert, that comforter's not for use. It's for looks. <laughs> All of our beds, our bed at home, we take the comforter off before we go to bed every night and put it up. We have 14 pillows on our bed at home. <laughs> and we take 12 of them off before we go to bed. <laughs> I'm not lying, I counted. There are 14, I wanted to be accurate. <laughs> we have 14 pillows on our bed right now. And we only use, and we have a comforter that we don't ever sleep under. <laughs> it's not for use, it's for looks. I have since found out, this is when we were first married, I was telling you about, but I have since found out we have many things in our home that are not for use, they're for looks. We have towels that you can use that I can't use. <laughs> they're called guest towels. I've gotten in trouble many times for using your towels. <laughs> I remember one time I got out of the shower, there was this beautiful, plump new towel. Wow, that's great, I start drying myself off. Debbie comes in, what are you doing? 
I don't know. <laughs> and ladies, listen to me. We don't know. We really don't. We don't know. And then what, you, what are you doing? Then, it, then here's the next question. What were you thinking? <laughs> I don't know. I really don't know what I was thinking. I'm wet, I'm naked, there's a towel. I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking. I should have used paper towels. I'm, I'm as shocked as you are. I'm just shocked that I did this. I don't know. But what she's saying, what, think about, go back to the original statement. She said, that comforter is not for use, it's for looks. And comforter is a word the Bible uses for the Holy Spirit. How many Christians today have a Holy Spirit that's not for use? He's just for looks. We have churches that he's for looks. And we have, a, we have other churches that he's not for use. But he's for use. So the Holy Spirit, Jesus brought the Holy Spirit. Here's point number two. The Holy Spirit is not weird. He is not weird. Let me give you the theological reason why people think this. Because people are weird. You have seen some weird people do some weird things and they, they say, the Holy Spirit led me to do it. No, no. They're just weird. <laughs> they would be weird without the Holy Spirit. They did a poll recently, one out of three people are weird. I'll prove it to you. Look at the person on your left. Look at the person on your right. If neither one of them are weird, Yeah, you're the weird one. All right, so the, I'm just joking. There's no poll. It's not one out of three. It's actually one out of two. People are weird. But <laughs> when I was growing up, I, was, I grew up in a smaller town. There were two churches that talked about the Holy Spirit. Two that, I, that we, everybody knew. These two churches talked about the Holy Spirit. Think about this. Now, I'm, just, I'm not making fun of a conviction that a person has, not at all. But I'm just telling you as a teenager, here's what I, one of them, the women wore no makeup at all. The other one, the women wore way too much makeup. Here's what I thought as a teenager. If I believe in the Holy Spirit, either way, I'm gonna marry an ugly woman. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's not the Holy Spirit. Even though there are wonderful people in both of those camps, that believe in the Holy Spirit and they're wonderful people. But that's not, what the, that's not who the Holy Spirit is. John 16, verse 12. Jesus said, watch how amazing this verse is. I still have many things to say to you. I don't know if you're catching this or not. Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, many things. But you cannot bear them now. However, when he the spirit of truth has come, he, and I'll tell you why I'm gonna, I'm underlining the word he later, he will guide you into all truth. Jesus said, I'd like, I said, I have more things to tell you, but I'm not gonna tell you, but he'll tell you. The Holy Spirit will tell you when he comes. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. That right there settles all debate on whether the Holy Spirit speaks or not. Because Jesus himself said, he will speak. He'll speak. And he will tell you things come. All right, it says he will guide you into all truth. How's he gonna guide you into all truth? Simple, because he knows all truth. Why does he know all truth? Simple, because he's God. He's God. He's the third person of the Godhead. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he knows everything. Have you ever thought about this? What, what, what is the Holy Spirit's IQ? 
What is God's IQ? Well, may, I might shock you to say, but God does not have an IQ. Because IQ stands for intelligence quotient. Quotient is a ratio, a mathematical ratio to figure out a number. Okay, there is no ratio that you can figure out God. He's off the charts. God has I, intelligence, but he doesn't have Q. He doesn't have, a, he doesn't have any measuring stick. He's infinite. So think about this. He knows everything. Now, think about this. You have someone living inside of you who knows everything there is to know about everything. And he has committed himself to be your teacher. So why don't you ever talk to him? Why don't you ask him how to raise kids? He knows everything about everything. Why don't you ask him about what to do with your business or where to live or where to move or where to buy this or not? He knows everything. He, I'm telling you, some of you are educated people. You're an idiot compared to the Holy Spirit. I hate to tell you that, but if, you're sure, if you haven't figured it out yet, he knows more than you. And he's committed himself. Here's the reason I think people don't talk to the Holy Spirit. I think that they don't see him as a person. And you will never develop a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit if you don't see him as a person. Again, think about the word person all. You develop a personal relationship with the person. And the reason I underlined the word he a while ago is because the Bible never, listen, never refers to him as it. And a lot of Christians do. They say we need it. We need the Holy Spirit. No, we don't need it. We need him. He's a person. So I was thinking about this one time and talking to the Lord about it. I said, Lord, I think the reason that many people don't see him as a person is because of his name. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. I mean, think about the Father and the Son, Jesus I said, and, and so the Lord and I, you know, we have these conversations, and so he said, well, what do you think I should do? <laughs> and I said, well, I think if you would have given him a name, you gave Jesus a name, Jesus, I'm gonna go talk to Jesus. I'm gonna go talk to the Father. We know the Father's a person, but the Holy Spirit. I said, I think if you'd have, you know, if you'd have just given him a name, then it probably would have helped. And so the Lord said to me, well, what name should I give him? And I thought a minute, and I came up with, I think, a good one. I said, Bill. (laughs) I mean, think about it. If he was named Bill, the wild churches could call him Billy. (laughs) Wild Billy, you know. And the formal churches could call him William. (laughs) And the churches like us that are in between, we just call him Bill. I'm going to talk to Bill, you know. Well, here's what the Lord showed me. The Holy Spirit is not his name. That's not his name. That is not his name. That is his description. The the Father, that's his description. The Son, the Holy Spirit. But hopefully you got ahead of me. I'm gonna tell you what his name is. Think about this. God, the Father. God, the Son. And God, the Son the Holy Spirit. His name is God. That's his name. His name's God. And he lives inside of us. And here's number three. Let the river flow. Let the river flow. God said, out of of those who come to me on a thirst, come to me, and there's gonna be a river flowing in you. Let it flow. Now, um, I understand this is gonna, I don't have time to go into this. Um, I wrote a book years ago called The God I Never Knew and I go into a prayer language and I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about a prayer language. I'm gonna distinguish a little bit between the gift of tongues and the prayer language. But, so I don't have time to cover this fully but I knew I was supposed to cover it. 
James 3, verse 7 says, For every kind of beast and bird and reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. Think about even lion tamers, dolphin trainers, every creature, he says, can be tamed. But no man can tame the tongue. He goes, I don't have time to read the whole passage. He said, just the tongue can set on fire an entire forest. You ever said something and burned the forest down? <laughs> forest of relationships? Okay. The tongue is like the rudder on a ship. It turns a big ship, small member of the body. But listen to this. No man can tame the tongue. Now, ladies, don't be thinking. Well, I already knew no man can do it. Because <laughs> I live with a man. And there is no filter between his brain and his mouth. Okay. When the Bible says man, you're included. I'm not, you're not male, but you are man. It said mankind. You're man. Let me, by, by the way, let me just remind you of your name. Whoa, man. Right? You're mankind. So no, I'm not, you're not male, but you are man. When the Bible says no man can tame the tongue, that's you're included. Where you got the woe from is when Adam saw Eve naked. Woe. I just, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Still, I'm still pumped up from the men's conference. We, uh, we talked about sex a little bit at the men's conference. And so, all right. Whoa, man. All right, so anyway. Okay, so, so what's, the, what's the thing? No man can tame the Holy Spirit. What's our hope then? I mean, no man can tame the tongue. Well, our hope is no man can do it, but the Holy Spirit can. And isn't it amazing that there's a gift that requires you to yield your tongue to the Holy Spirit? But no person can tame it, but the Holy Spirit can tame it. But you can actually do, by the way, there's a gift of tongues and a grace of tongues. And everybody can pray in tongues. Everybody can. It's not the gift. People tell me all the time, well, pastor, I don't have the gift. And if God wants to give me the gift, I've told him he can give me the gift. I don't mean this wrong, but that's just such bad theology, it's incredible. It's horrible theology. That'd be like walking by the offering box and money jump out of your pocket in the offering box and you say, oh, look, I got the gift of giving. I've been praying that if God wanted to give me that gift, he'd give me that gift and apparently, no, you're gonna have to write out a large check. I mean, if we're gonna talk about writing a check, let's say large, a large check and put it in there yourself, right? Okay, so you gotta cooperate with God. But there's a difference in the gift of tongues and the grace of tongues. The gift of tongues is public and the grace of tongues is private. It's a private prayer language. And the gift of tongues can only be done when unbelievers and uninformed people are not present. That's 1 Corinthians 14. And it has to be interpreted. Uh, and if you want an example of this, when, our ki when your kids are young, I don't know if you, ever, if you ever had this, but normally the first child has the gift of interpretation and the second child has the gift of tongues. But when Josh and James were young, we'd be at the dinner table and James would say, abba da boo boo ba 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 ba. And Josh would say, he wants more corn. <laughs> and I would test it, you know, so I'd give him some mashed potatoes, you know, and he'd go, ah! <laughs> and then I'd give him some corn and he'd, yeah, like that. And Josh would say, told you. <laughs> so my... James had the gift of tongues. Josh had the gift of interpretation, okay? So we're not talking about the gift of tongues. We're talking about the grace of tongues. We're talking about a prayer language. And every Christian can pray in a prayer language. Every Christian can. And by the way, if you say, well, why would I want to pray in a prayer language? Well, I can just give you one, just one of the reasons, and I can list 10. I actually have 10 reasons. I don't have time to do it. 10 reasons why every Christian should pray in a prayer language. But here's just one. The Bible says it builds you up. That means it strengthens you. So there's probably no one here that would say to me, Pastor, I'm glad it does build you up, but I just have all the building up I can handle. I just can't be built up anymore. So, all right, so here, here's why I wanna show you that it is voluntary. It is voluntary to pray in tongues, all right? 1 Corinthians 14, this is Paul, 
who wrote a, about a third of the New Testament. Some people will, you'll hear sometimes people will say half because he wrote 13 of 27 books. But when you take the word count, it's about a third, okay? By the way, someone else wrote more of the New Testament than Paul. Do y'all mind these little facts? People don't know these. Luke. Luke. The book of Luke and the book of Acts is more than the 13 epistles, word count. And then the third person would be John. He wrote John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and Revelation. Okay, never mind. I'm just, it's just fun to me to learn these things. But here's what Paul says in 1st Corinthians 14. I will say this, he's the greatest apostle to ever live. We know that, there's no doubt. But he did write a third of the New Testament, which is a third more than you wrote. All right, all right, so. 1st Corinthians 14, verse 14. For if I pray in a tongue, so you can pray in a tongue. And the greatest apostle who will ever live prayed in a tongue. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. Wouldn't it be okay if you let your spirit pray? But my understanding is unfruitful. Under the word understanding here, 95% uh, of the time when it translates, translated mind. In other words, my mind doesn't understand what I'm saying. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. Now again, I don't have time to do a whole thing on, on praying in the spirit, but here's the greatest apostle that ever lived. And someone, one guy said to me, he said, if I pray in a tongue, there's no proof that he ever did. I said, read just four verses down. Verse 18, Paul said, I pray in tongues more than all of you. So yes, there is proof. But if I pray, okay, please hear me, it's not uncontrollable. Why would he give, um, why, why, think about this, why would he give instructions about when and how to pray or speak in tongues if it was uncontrollable? It's controllable, you have a choice. You, you can build yourself up in the spirit or you cannot build yourself up in the spirit. You're not gonna, one day, don't be afraid that if you yield the Holy Spirit, you're gonna be at Kroger's one day <laughs> and you're gonna grab the intercom and start speaking in tongues. It's not gonna happen. You could have the gift of teaching, but you can control it. You can have the gift of serving, you can control it, okay? So, so I just want you to know, if I, I will, I will, that means it's a choice. Here's what happens when I pray in the Spirit. I get so much more sensitive to the Holy Spirit. I can see things that I couldn't see before. I can say things, I can say the river starts flowing through me. So I'll tell you one last thing and I'm done. I was uh, preaching one time and there was a man, I found this out later, that had been out of church for 12 years. 12 years. Raised in church, out of church for 12 years. Something happened, he got bitter and he left church. Happens to a lot of people. I'm not saying it's right, but it does happen to a lot of people. So finally, he, say, he and his wife kept talking, and finally he said, okay, I agree, we need to go back to church. On the way to church, he pulls over. This, is, this was a big man, big, big, strong man on the company. He pulls over, and, his wife, and he's on the verge of tears. And his wife says, honey, what's wrong? And he said, I'm the prodigal son. My whole life, I felt like the prodigal son. And I'm afraid that when I go back to church today, that God's gonna ask me, where have you been and what have you been doing? So he comes to church that day. I was preaching on the prodigal son. He comes down to the altar to pray and the Holy Spirit speaks to me. By the way, every time before I preach, I pray in the Spirit. So if you want to know if you have a, a wild pastor, you do. You don't have a weird one, but you have a wild one who's wild about Jesus Christ. Totally wild about him. But it causes me to be sensitive to the spirit and it lets the river flow through me. And so I saw this guy come down and boom, I got this immediately, immediate thought. Now think about this. I, walk right, I just walked over to him and I knelt down on the platform and I whispered in, her ear, in his ear and I said, I know. No, I didn't. I said, the Father. I said, the Father wants me to tell you that he knows 
that you see yourself as the prodigal son. But the father wanted me to tell you that he does not care where you've been or what you've done. He just wants his son back. Now that doesn't happen just to pastors. That happens to Christians who let the river flow through them. Streams in the desert. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Every week we say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? I want you to just do it again. Just ask the Holy Spirit. You're talking to God, by the way. Remember, he's the third person of the Godhead. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? And I really want to encourage you. You may say, I thought I had to wait. I thought it was a gift some people had. I didn't know everyone could pray in the Spirit. I don't even know how to do it. I would encourage you to get the book, not, not, not for more book sales, but to help you. Or to, I, I preached in uh, uh, January and February 2016 on the Holy Spirit. And I, the last message, the first weekend of February of 2016, I talked about how to pray in the Spirit and gave very practical things. You could go back and listen to it. But if God is speaking to you, I, I'm encouraging you to follow up. Let the, let the river flow. He came to bring a river to a dry place. And you need to let the river flow through you. Thank you.